we're in Revelation, the seventh chapter, right at the end. We're almost done. Uh, Revelation 7 uh, gives us two pictures of the faithful. Okay, two pictures of the people of God. Uh, one of those pictures involves those individuals who are on the earth. And the other picture are those who are in heaven. They've come through the great tribulation. Uh, they may have perished in the great tribulation. And now they're in the very presence of the Almighty God Himself. And they are crying out unto God. And they ask one question. How long, O Lord? Right? And God tells them, just be patient. Now, folks, sometimes we just have to what? <laughs> very good. Be patient. Sometimes we just have to wait on God, don't we? And um, I find it interesting that God knew that there were still going to be some Christians who were going to die. There were still going to be some Christians that had to face persecution and hardship and ultimately death. He wasn't going to stop everything right then just because His people were crying out to Him how long? Uh, God has His plans, God has His timing, and He will bring to pass what needs to be passed in His own good time. Uh, the reason He pictured those on earth is because He said, I'm not going to allow my angels to go forth until my people have been sealed. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Okay, folks, God knows who His people are. God cares for His people. He sealed His people. And He knows exactly who those individuals are. Okay? And uh, then He gives us this picture of those in heaven who are, you know, a little bit um, anxious, uh, wanting things to come to pass very quickly, and uh, wanting it to come to an end. And so He says, no, just be, just be faithful, just be patient, and things will happen. And uh, we're given a big description, a wonderful description, of those individuals. The Bible says that they have made their robes white in what? The blood of the Lamb. And that they have come through the tribulation. Folks, does that describe the Christian life pretty well? It does, doesn't it? You first have to do what? Make your robes white in the blood of the Lamb, don't you? You have to become a Christian. You have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to be immersed into Christ for the remission of your sins. And after that, Christianity can be a struggle, can it not? And it can be a hardship. There can be many difficulties. It can be looked upon as somewhat of a tribulation period. Maybe not as bad now as it was then, but it's still a struggle, isn't it? And so, but all those who make their robes white, who come through the tribulation faithfully, guess where you go? You go into the presence of God, don't you? And uh, we ended uh, the last time we discussed this uh, with the Bible saying this, they serve Him day and night in His temple. And we made the point that if you don't like serving God now, guess what? You probably won't make it to heaven. Okay, because you will hate it there. Oh, I've got to serve God. You know, folks, you're not going up there to kick back in your hammock and go fishing. Okay, all these pictures that we have. Oh, I can't wait to get up there in that big golf place in the sky. You know, like you're just going to play golf all day. Or you're going to get in your little jet boat and take off and be fishing. All that, that is not heaven. Okay, that is not what the Bible pictures as heaven. We're going to go to heaven. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to be serving and praising and worshiping the Almighty God of heaven. Okay, And it won't be uh, a chore, will it? In fact, it shouldn't be a what? A chore now, should it? It ought to be a wonderful privilege that you and I have to be able to worship the Almighty God. Okay, Now notice we're at point number 13 in the outline. He that sitteth on the throne, watch this, shall what? Dwell among them. Wow. Question. Is God's presence with His people on earth right now? Yes. Um, does God dwell among us right now? Yes. But we know that and we accept that how? By faith, don't we? We can't literally see God. 
We can't put our hands on God. Um, we can talk to God through prayer, and He can talk to us through His Word, but we can't carry on a back-to-back -back conversation like we can. But one of these days, folks, guess what? If we're faithful, He will dwell among the people of God. That little word dwell means to tent, to encamp, to occupy, to reside as God did in the tabernacle of old, a symbol of protection and community. What a beautiful, beautiful picture it is, folks. Uh, in fact, one man made the statement, perhaps an allusion to the tabernacle in the wilderness. Okay? God will be tabernacled among His people. God will set up His tent among the people. And the only difference is, guess what? It will be a permanent dwelling, won't it? We will be with Him forever and ever and ever. A man by the name of Professor Stewart writes the following. God will spread His tent over them as meaning that He would receive them into intimate connection and union with Him and offer them His protection. Folks, it's not a matter of just our going to heaven and serving God. God gives back in return, doesn't He? And part of that is the blessing of our being with Him. Okay? Um, I don't know. It's... Uh, is that something hard to grasp? Being in the presence of God? When you think of it, what comes to your mind? Anything? When you think of being in the presence of God, what comes to your mind? Huh? Wow. What did you say? Safety. Safety. Okay. Okay, so Mike's going to be little and God's going to be big. Okay, uh, this majestic individual standing and towering over us. You see, isn't it funny how we all have these ideas of what that's going to be? In fact, and maybe some of us have never even tried to conceptualize it. Okay, uh, because it's almost too hard to conceptualize, isn't it? To, to be in the presence of of the Almighty God. Right now the Bible says, no man hath seen God at any time. But guess what? Then we will, won't we? We'll be able to see that divine being. We'll be able to see Jesus Christ. We'll be able to see the Holy Spirit. And we'll be walking among them, and they'll be walking among us. And folks, what a wonderful, wonderful picture that will be. Um, the only one I have trouble with, the, the one that I have the most trouble with, is the Holy Spirit. Okay, and I, I'll tell you why. I can see God walking among us as our Father. Okay? And, and I can see that relationship, a father and a child. Can't you? And then I can see Jesus as a man. Because He's going to have a spiritual body just like we do. Okay, he's, going to have, he's already got his spiritual body. And when he comes again, then we're going to possess a body just like him. And he will continue to be like a shepherd unto us. And like an elder brother unto us. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, he's like the Father in that he's a spirit. But what relationship will we really sustain with him in the hereafter? That, that's going to be an interesting relationship, isn't it? Because it's very, you know, he's given us the revelation of God, hasn't he? And, uh, but it's very difficult to kind of picture what my relationship will be with the Holy Spirit uh, at that time. But I do know that we'll be dwelling among them. And what a beautiful, beautiful thought. If it's just you and the Godhead, wouldn't that be wonderful? If nobody else made it, but just you and the Godhead. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But fortunately, that won't be the case, will it? But it would be wonderful. All right, so number one, one of the blessings we'll have is we get to dwell among whom? We get to dwell among deity. Now notice this next statement. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. True or false? Hunger and thirst are natural Powerful desires of man. Oh yes, folks, these are the most basic desires of man. Jim?
Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, um, hunger and thirst, they involve natural desires, don't they? It's just natural. And they involve two desires that are absolutely essential for what? For life. Folks, you don't eat, you die, right? You don't drink, you die. That's why God has instilled within us these desires for those things. So that we can sustain life. There, guess what? You're never going to hunger. You're never going to thirst. Wow. Let me ask you this. In Bible times, did those individuals understand what hunger and thirst really are? Oh, yes. Folks, they did. Okay? And I'm going to ask this question, and I want you to be honest about it, okay? Just, just as honest as you can be, okay? Two questions. How many of you have ever really, really experienced hunger? Isn't that amazing? When we were in preacher school, there was a guy, he was fasting and trying to learn how to fast. And he was constantly increasing his days that he would fast. Uh, he was up to like uh, 21 days. That, he, that was the longest I think he had gone at that particular time. And so that kind of caught on in the class for a little while. Not, not a long while, a little while. <laughs> um, and so uh, there was about five of us got together and said, let's fast for seven days. Okay, and so we did. We fasted seven days. All you could do is drink. Okay, that's all you could do is drink. And uh, no food, no solid food. Let me tell you something. Man, after about that third, fourth day, it starts taking a toll on you. You know what? And that water and stuff that you're, boy, that tastes so good. But boy, you can't. We, we went to a cafeteria and where you get all you could eat when we got that seventh day. Boy, we busted it wide open. Um, <laughs> But back then they faced war, drought, pestilence, famine, economic downturns, imprisonment, and even pathless deserts through which they had to travel. You go on a trip and guess what? It may be at a certain time of the year when there is no rain, right? And guess what you don't have? You don't have loves. To stop at on the side of the road. Do you? You don't have 7-Eleven. You don't have Circle K. You don't have Wawa. Even though it does sound a little Hebrew. Okay? You, you just don't have any of those things. We have those things on every corner, don't we? Nobody in here has ever experienced, really experienced hunger. Folks, these guys did. They knew what it was. And many of them may have... Uh, faced it several times in their life. Uh, a thought of a place where satisfying even the basic necessities of life are no longer contemplated as a true blessing. You know what? No hunger and thirst. And we say, eh, I don't hunger and thirst now. See, to us, that's not a true blessing. But guess what? To those people, that was something for which to look forward. It's difficult uh, because, because you're going to get down to another part of this text, okay? And uh, um, there are some who say because we have a spiritual body, a spiritual body doesn't have flesh and bone, and so therefore it doesn't have to have what? It doesn't have to have food and drink, okay? And so there'll be no more what? There'll be no more hunger. There'll be no more thirst. There won't even be the desires for those things because of the body that we possess. And uh, then all of a sudden you get down uh, a couple of verses later and he says what? The Lord will feed them. And he will lead them to fountains of living water. So individuals are saying, well, does that mean that 
we won't thirst and we won't hunger because we will have all of our needs fulfilled. Okay? Uh, the reality is, guess what? There's no way to determine all of those things. Okay? Um, in my mind, uh, when we get to the, uh, his, his feeding us and His uh, um, giving us water to drink, I believe those are on a spiritual plateau myself. Okay? I don't think we'll have any hunger, any thirst whatsoever. Okay? There won't even be the chance of that. Okay, Jim? Yes. Well, it could also indicate that it was the uh, ho angelic host who did what? Who brought that to man and supplied that to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. Okay, angel food. Um, June? What about them? <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and, you know, the word eat uh, is used in a lot of different senses, okay, uh, in Scripture. So uh, it's very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to know all of those things, okay? Um, very, very interesting, though. Notice this next point, number, number uh, 15. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any what? Nor any heat. Now, there's probably some individuals in here who have suffered from hard, hard work out in the sun and in the heat in times past, haven't you? Okay, you know what that feels like. I've had a few days like that in my life. Not very many, but a few. Uh, even working out in the yard and other places. Okay, uh, we went down to uh, uh, one of the uh, cities that was torn up by a uh, um, tornado. And boy, we worked from like 7 in the morning till 9 at night. And uh, I tell you what, about 9 o'clock, you are just about beat. Okay, but guess what? About noon, about four, we got to go into the AC. Guess what they didn't have back then? There was no AC, was there? Okay. In fact, there wasn't even ICE. Was there? You know, they didn't have, they didn't have ice. You didn't walk up there and get you a few cubes and rub all over your body. No, they didn't have ice. Okay, you can go get you a Slurpee. Couldn't go get you one of the big daddies or whatever they call them at, you know, Circle K. They would have all that stuff, folks. And uh, life was tough. So, uh, again, there's this promise that you're, you're not going to experience the heat of the sun. You're not going to experience the heat of the dry winds of the region. You're never going to face that again. You're going to live in absolute what? Comfort. What a word. Comfort. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. Folks, he's trying to get across the blessings that are going to be ours when there. And he uses physical terms in order to get us to appreciate what is going to be there. Okay? You're not going to have to worry about the basic needs of life anymore. Does that um, drive a lot of individuals' decisions today? Oh, yeah. It, in fact, it drives almost everybody's decisions, doesn't it? Food on the table. You hear that all the time. Got to put food on the table. You see that need for what? To satisfy hunger. Okay, that's, that's a big one. And so uh, when, you, when you just think, okay, I no longer have to carry about the basic necessities of life. I don't, have to one, I don't have to be concerned about all these things that bring hardship and difficulty like heat and the, and the bright sunshine. I don't have to worry about any of those things anymore. This is a place of absolute what? Perfection. And that's what he's trying to get these individuals to understand. Notice point 16. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall what? Shall feed them. Uh oh, see there? That's what Larry was talking about a while ago. Okay? So we don't hunger and thirst because we're constantly what? Fed. Folks, I don't think physical food is going to be even a part of our routine up there. Okay. That little word fed there is a Greek word that means this. And the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them. Okay? Shall shepherd them. 
Just because we've changed our position from earth to heaven doesn't mean that our Lord is still not going to be what? Watching over us. Okay? And a shepherd does a lot of things, doesn't he? He watches, he guides, he leads, he feeds, he doctors, he protects. It's the idea that what? You don't have anything to fear from anything on the outside. Okay? Nothing. Because guess what you have? You have the Lord constantly what? Shepherding over you. I find it interesting when uh, you, heard, you heard of a sheepfold. Does anybody know what that is? A sheepfold? Anybody describe one? Okay, a place of safety. A shelter. But do you know how they're built? With a roof on it. <laughs> Yeah, they put up a metal building and just bring them jokers in there. Okay, Susan? Okay. Okay, usually the wall is in the shape of an arc. Okay. And the very back part, the back, what we would call the back wall, is not rock at all. It's, it's a hill. Okay? And that hill rises up over the what? Over the sheepfold. Now there is a door at the front of that facility so all the sheep can go in and then he can do what? Close the door. Well then the shepherd goes around and guess where he gets? He gets on top of the hill so that he can what? Watch over the flock through the course of the night, okay? So the sheep hear something, right? The roar of a lion. The cry of a bear. And guess what they do? They wake up, don't they? They turn their little heads around, they're looking around, and all of a sudden, guess who they see? They see the shepherd watching over them. And guess what they do? They just put their little heads back down and go back to sleep. Why? Because we have a shepherd watching over us. Now, now we live in this world and by faith we know that, don't we? We have a shepherd who's watching over us, Jesus Christ. But guess what? Can you imagine being there? And you can just turn and guess who you can look upon? You can turn and see the shepherd. How wonderful it'd be, won't it? We got nothing to worry about. Our shepherd will do what? The shepherd shall feed them. Jesus is the great agent who will promote the happiness of the redeemed in heaven. Notice this. He shall lead them unto fountains of what? Living waters. Did you read it right? It didn't say a fountain of living water. It says what? Fountains of living waters. Plural. Man, that's good stuff. Folks, a fountain in the wilderness is one of the greatest blessings that someone could come upon. Did you know that? Because of many things. Number one, the water is cool, isn't it? Number two, the water is refreshing. Number three... The water is life-giving. Number four, the water is ever-flowing. It is coming from a fountain, a spring deep within the earth. It constantly flows. It never stops. And number five, it is abundant. When they found a fountain, oftentimes they would build a community around a fountain. Did you know that? It's the source of life, wasn't it? When they were in the wilderness, guess what they were looking for? An oasis. Were they not? What is an oasis? Folks, it's nothing more than a fountain in the what? In the middle of a desert, isn't it? And that's where the, you know, that they, would, they would move from oasis to oasis. Or at least try to. Because they knew there's good water there. There's a place to rest. Uh, you know, it, it's refreshing. We can stop and uh, take care of our animals, folks. Heaven will be a source of pleasure and enjoyment. Heaven will be a place wherein blessings will flow forever and ever and ever. Wow. 
Just unbelievable. And lastly, God shall what? God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Mm. Got to thinking about tears. And there's three big realms that cause tears to be produced in man. Okay? Number one, physical harm to our bodies. All of us have had physical things happen to our bodies that bring us to tears, haven't we? Broken arms, scratches, car wrecks that have hurt our bodies. Maybe there's been sicknesses. Maybe there's been operations. Maybe there's just been uh, parts of our body that get old and start to falter. And, you know, uh, and all of us have cried because of those things. So there's one way that tears are formed within us. Secondly, emotional struggles. Can they bring tears? Oh, yeah. They can bring some big tears, can't they? You know, uh, a, a, a child is unfaithful and does not uh, stay faithful to the Lord. Does that hurt the parent? Oh, yeah, that can bring tears to that parent. Uh, we lose someone, and we get, get word of that, don't we? And that brings tears to our life. So we've got these emotional things. Maybe it's a friend who betrays us, and that can bring tears. And then the third thing are spiritual tears, okay? And those tears can come from a lot of different reasons, can't they? Maybe I cry because of my sin. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. You see, there comes a time when I need to what? Cry and weep over my sins. James says, be afflicted and mourn and weep over our transgressions. So sometimes it's my sin that will cause me to weep. And sometimes it's the sin of another person that might cause me to weep, mightn't it? And it might be the fact that somebody rejects the precious gospel of Jesus Christ that causes me to weep. Or maybe I know someone who's died in a lost condition and I know they'll stand before God in the last day and that causes me to weep. Listen to the promise again. God shall wipe away what? You better emphasize that word. You got to learn how to preach, folks. All tears. Every one of them. The definition of all. There will be no more tears in heaven. Don't we sing a song to that effect? No tears in heaven. Man. No tears in heaven. Think of the pain, suffering those early Christians had experienced and were experiencing at the very time of this writing. You get a call, right? One of your family members has been cast into prison. One of your family members has just suffered death at the hands of the Jews or of the Romans. Man. All of a sudden, you've got a little bitty baby and you hear the enemy entering into your town and you know what? Your little baby might be the one that's grabbed and taken from you. You don't think that caused a mama to weep? Those it was rough times back then. Wicked times back then. God shall do what? Wipe away all tears from their eyes. Man. Flip over very quickly just for a moment. I just want to look at the opening part of this and uh, we'll, we'll finish it uh, again in our next session. But in Revelation 6, Six seals were opened, were they not? Remember chapter 5? Jesus grabs the book from the Almighty God. That book has seven seals on it. Well, we go to chapter 6, and guess what? Six seals were boom, boom, boom. Open, 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 open. And then all of a sudden, everything comes to a stop. And we have this interlude period, chapter 7. These two pictures of the righteous. One on earth, one in heaven. Well, what about the what? What about the seventh seal? Ah, welcome to chapter 8. Welcome to chapter 8. 
It begins with the opening of that seal. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Wow. Up to this time, there had been six seals opened, and had there been a lot of activity and a lot of action transpiring in the heavens? First four seals, horse after horse after horse after horse, right? Just unbelievable. And you just see all of this activity going on in heaven. And then all of a sudden, there's the Lord, and He opens the seventh seal, and guess what? There is dead silence in heaven. For how long? It's right there by the space of what? Half an hour. Anybody know how long that is? 30 minutes. Okay. Oh, man, we're not trying to fool you. Okay. 30 minutes. Now, folks, let me tell you something. If, I, if, if I'm up here preaching or teaching and I stop for 30 seconds, guess what you'll do? Every eye will look at me. What's wrong with that preacher? He shut up. <laughs> You, you know something got to be wrong with him if he shuts up, right? There's been all this activity transpiring in heaven, and then all of a sudden you open that seventh seal, and there is dead silence in the heavens for 30 long minutes. Man. Guess what you do? You just sit, and you just what? You just wait. And you wait. And you wait. It's kind of like turning on Netflix and the thing just keeps doing this. <clears throat> and you just what? You just wait until it comes on. Well, folks, that's exactly what's going on in heaven right now. Okay? Now, there's some individuals who believe that the seventh seal consists only of the silence in heaven. Okay? And then what follows is a totally different aspect of John's revelation. And then there are other individuals who believe that the seventh seal is opened and that everything that follows from here until the end of the seventh woe is part of what? The seven seals. Okay? Nino, no. Okay, I have a tendency to think that it's all part of the seventh seal. Okay, now <clears throat> let me uh, let me tell you something as we're about to enter into this next study. Okay, we're about we're going to eventually get into some tough stuff in Revelation. Okay, and I got to thinking about this today. You ever heard that little statement when you sign any kind of a contract or anything? The devil's in the details, folks. The joy of Revelation is in the details. Okay. You see, what we like to do is we like to have this big, broad view of Revelation, right? Well, it's talking about the fall of Jerusalem. No, it's talking about the Romans and getting rid of the Roman persecution. See, that's the, what, that's the big, broad picture. But guess where the joy is? The joy is in the details. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And they shall hunger and they shall thirst what? No more. God's in control, right? How long, O oh Lord? Just wait. The joy of the book of Revelation is in the details. You see, we like all, we, we want to know all these little hard facts, hard stuff, don't we? That guess what? We're probably never going to be able to know for sure. So what we need to do is get in there and look at the details and, and get those things out that really benefit us as Christians. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go through the study. Thank you. Hey. <clears throat>